morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's take a moment and bring this morning's worship to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for this opportunity to come together and to worship you. We just pray for everybody here at New Mercies and ask that you'd be with us today. Open our hearts as we hear the word that Pastor brings us and just uh, help us hear that word and carry it with us this week. We thank you so much, God, for all of our blessings and all the things you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and help us make a joyful noise.
take me as you find me All my fears and failures
We're so thankful that uh, we have this opportunity and the freedom that we enjoy and a Savior that's so, so worth uh, honoring. A uh, few announcements. Uh, we have a community day coming up next week, uh, especially for the kids and bring grandchildren and everybody else for that. Uh, we have all sorts of activities uh, throughout the day, free hot dogs, free hamburgers, free chili dogs, uh, uh, lots of other things uh, going on. So we, we hope you'll plan to come. That's from 11 to 5 next week. Uh, there will be a meeting immediately following the service this morning uh, to go over some final details for that. So we encourage everyone to stay for that meeting. Uh, and we will be setting up on Friday. Is that at 6 o'clock, I think? The, uh, okay, Friday we'll give you pizza if you come and work. Um, the church printer uh, copier is not working, and so I knew that, so I was going to print out the script. That's why there's no bulletins. Uh, the scripture sheets, I figured, well, I'll just do it at home. I went to do it last night, and I ran out of ink. So you have, some of you have one side of the sheet, um, but uh, so share if you, if, you, uh, if you have one and your neighbor doesn't uh, share those scripture sheets uh, this morning. Um, there will be no hymn sing normally the second uh, Saturday night is our hymn sing, but I don't think people will be up to a hymn sing after community day. Uh, we'll be just closing up and uh, worn out by then. So uh, that's, uh, we'll resume in uh, September. Hard to believe that it's August already, but uh, lots of good things. Uh, any other announcements we need to, that I didn't see in the bulletin? Okay, we need cookies, and the cookies need to be here by by Tuesday. Okay, very good. If you're bringing something, bring it here by Tuesday. Okay. Uh, for our prayer requests, um, Evan Lichty, you, you, most of you know Evan sits in the back uh, with his wife, Pat, and their kids who are here today, or kids and grandchildren here today. Uh, Evan uh, had, had some issues lately. He was diagnosed with early stages of Parkinson, and he also uh, has bladder cancer and will be having surgery on Tuesday. Uh, he had some issues last night. They took him to the emergency room and he will stay in the hospital till Tuesday, and they moved his surgery up for that. So be in prayer for him. Uh, Dan Fisher had his surgery last week, and I saw his picture home uh, with his little bell to ring so his wife would uh, <laughs> come and, and meet his every need, <laughs> like, like she always does. Okay, uh, Jeff Toll uh, had his surgery, uh, back surgery on Wednesday, uh, Dr. Kellis did that uh, down at the Crystal Clinic in Akron, uh, and Dr. Kellis said it was the hardest surgery he ever did. So it was more complicated than they thought with nerves and different things, different issues, but the surgery went well, and he is home recovering, uh, but in, in quite a bit of, of pain. Uh, good to see Bernie Alpers back. Uh, she had had a fall and wasn't able to drive for a while, and it's good to see her back. Sandy Stritchko, uh, hard to recognize because she doesn't have her neck brace on. Uh, so uh, thankful for that. And also remember uh, Ken and Jackie Gingrich. So let's bow. Uh, remember Shirley, what is, how's Shirley doing? Okay, she had had a heart attack or? Okay, okay, good, thank you. Yeah, okay, Judy, Judy Marks also. Let's bow for prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the goodness of life. And uh, we thank you for the beauty of the world that's all around us. We thank you for the family that we have, the friendship that we have uh, through the church as we uh, are your family. And you are our heavenly father and you care for us. And uh, our lives are so blessed because of 
the faith that we have in you and your goodness to us. But we know that there are times in this life when sorrow and sickness come. And we know that you're with us in those times as well. So we pray for Evan as he will be undergoing surgery uh, this week. Uh, be with Dan and Jeff as they recover. Uh, thank you that Bernie and Sandy are able to be back with us again and be with Ken and Jackie. As we look to your word, Father, you have the, the key to life, the answers. You made us. You know us. You know what we need, and you have given us that truth through your word. And Jesus came as an example of who you want us to be, and we thank you for all of that. And bless us in our time together. May our hearts be open, and may we allow your word to penetrate into our hearts and help us as we draw close to you. We ask your blessing on us in this service, and we thank you for your goodness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Children are dismissed. <clears throat> we have somebody visiting today and ask them, uh, they said they watched us online, and uh, it seems like most of the people recently that have been starting to come uh, have seen us online. So we're, we're thankful for technology and for that opportunity. We're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, one of the early teachings of Jesus, the longest teaching that we have recorded for us in the Bible. It's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And it's, it's really about how to live. You know, as I said before, God made us and he knows what we need. And if we just listen to him, life would be a lot better. And I think we'll find that as we get talking about the things at the end of the message today to realize how much better life it'd be if we would just listen, you know, to what God tells us to do. Not a lot of theology. He doesn't mention that he's going to the cross, that he's going to die for our sins. But this is mainly a little bit about how to be related to God, but more so how to be related to one another. Uh, in the beginning, we looked at the Beatitudes and then the salt and light. We are to be the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hid. We don't hide it under a bushel as we learn in the song as children, but we let our light shine so that people may see our goodness, the good deeds that we do, and praise our Father who is in heaven. So Jesus came to be the light of the world. Light illuminates so you can see and you don't trip over things, you don't fall down because you're blind, you know, but you're able to see and go on. And uh, last week we looked at the fact that Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. The things the prophets talked about, about Jesus coming, uh, he didn't come to abolish those. He didn't come to abolish the Ten Commandments, but he came to fulfill them to give new meaning to the things uh, that he has done. And so today we're uh, picking up just after Jesus said he didn't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And what he's going to, to talk about in our lesson today is how he fulfilled the law. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone that is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And again, anyone that says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother or sister. Translations are changing a little bit, and I memorized it the other way. But, uh, and now it's brothers and sisters uh, to be inclusive, which I, I like that. Uh, leave your gift there. Go and be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. So he's talking about the sixth commandment, do not murder. You know, there's ten commandments. Uh, the first three deal with our relationship with God, and then the fourth one is the Sabbath, and then honor your parents, and then the sixth one is do not murder. So uh, sometimes we like laws if we keep them, right? Anybody here? I think I'm safe in asking this. Anybody here commit murder? <laughs> okay. 
Probably not, or you would be in jail somewhere instead of here with us today. So maybe we feel pretty good, you know, hey, I kept that commandment. Probably the only one that we have kept is we haven't murdered anybody. Uh, we maybe tell a lie once in a while. Maybe we, we envy something that somebody else has. You know, the other commandments are, are a little bit harder for us uh, to keep completely. But, that, but the fact that you didn't murder anyone, does that mean everything's okay? Oh, I'm good. Didn't murder anybody. It's not that way. Because... You can't make, the, you know what the trouble with laws are? You can't make a law that applies perfectly in every situation. So they understood that in the Old Testament. Uh, there were cities of refuge. Anybody know what a city of refuge was? When they went into the promised land, you know, after Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and they go in and they conquer the land, there were six cities of refuge. And... Uh, if you committed murder and it was kind of accidental or I forget exactly the conditions, you could run to a city of refuge and you could stay there, but you could never leave. So th there were sometimes if it was a bad crime, you know, bad, you know, premeditated, premeditated murder, you know, you would be killed. That was, you know, the, the, the consequence. You killed somebody, they killed you. Uh, but if in certain situations you could go to a city of refuge, but you could only stay there. It's hard to make laws that apply in every situation. Uh, that's why Jesus talks about not following the letter of the law, but following the intent of the law. So he said, you've heard that it was said, do not murder. And anybody who murders will be subject to judgment. But then he goes on to say, anyone that is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Same penalty, subject to judgment, for murder and anger. Okay, anybody been angry? <laughs> now all our hands go up because we have all been angry. And the Bible says, be angry, but don't sin. So you can be angry. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the, in the message. But anger causes us to do, uh, to do bad things. It's a condition of the heart. Because why do we murder? You're angry about something, so you allow your emotions to take over, and you do something that is destructive to somebody else. Who are you angry at? What did they do? How can you get back at them for what they have done? When God created us, he knows what our needs are. He knows what our emotions are. He knows how that we could operate so that we could have the best result in our life. And that's what he taught us, and that's what he's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Murder, okay, that's good. You didn't do that. But God cares more about how we relate to people than just not murdering them especially even physically. In Romans, the 12th chapter, he says, live in harmony with one another. Isn't that a key? Live in harmony. Don't you want that? In your home, don't you want harmony? How many like to be in a situation, you're out with a, two or three couples, and one of the couples gets in a big arguing match and they're shouting back and forth at each other? How many think that's a nice evening out? <laughs> no. It's not. We don't like uh, to be in places where there's arguing, shouting, discord. And so Jesus says, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. How do we live in harmony? Well, he, one of the things he says is don't be proud. You know, do you like to be around people that always have to be right, has to be their way, or uh, can be miserable? Willing to associate with people of low position. Uh, you know, a lot of times we like to hang out with people similar to us, right? Make about the same amount of money, uh, have the same habits or same things that we like to do, because if 
if it's people that are real poor, uh, maybe we wouldn't feel that way, or people that are real rich, then all we do would be envy everything that they have. So we like to be with people that are similar to us. But you know, God wants us all. Doesn't matter how much money a person has. Doesn't matter how little a person has. We should love them all equally. Uh, be willing, don't be conceited. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. You know, don't repay evil. Have you ever made a mistake? How did people react when you made a mistake? When it was your fault? How did, how did other people react? Did they say, oh, well, they did that. They said that to me, so I have to, you know, I have to counteract what they did by doing something in retaliation. We don't do that. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. I think we know the right thing to do. If you sit down and somebody lays out a scenario and says, well, this person did this and that person did that, and I say, well, what do you think they should do? We can probably, in most cases, know the right thing to tell them to do. But if one of the people in that situation is us, we don't have as good a judgment sometimes because we depend on ourselves. In verse 18 is, is to me, a key verse in the Bible that says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. There will be situations where you can't work it out. The other person just will not respond to anything. It just won't work. But what about your part? Did you do everything that you can, as much as it depends on you, live at peace? with all men. Have I done everything that I can? Don't take revenge, my dear friend, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So we don't have to play God, and when something is wrong, we don't have to step in and say, well, God would want this, and I'm going to make sure that that happens. We don't get to play God. Sometimes we think, well, why doesn't God do something? And if God isn't going to do something, I'll do it on his behalf. You know, so we have a, a self-righteousness about what we're doing. Uh, but he goes on to say, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. These are hard things. I, we have to admit that. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's an idiom that nobody understands what it was. It's like, like somebody says, if I say the Big Apple, what's the Big Apple? Uh, New York City, the big coals, burning coals on somebody's head. What does that mean? Nobody remembers. So, uh, but it's, you know, I think we can understand from what he has said that what you're doing is trying to be good to the person to get him to respond uh, and turn away from his negative. And he goes on in verse 21, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if we retaliate and uh, just say, oh, I have a right to do this, and we get belligerent and stuff like that, evil has taken over. Evil has won. Don't let evil overcome you. You overcome evil by doing something good. He will talk more about that later in the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, we want to live in harmony. We don't want there to be anger. And we, want to, we have to work to avoid that. Because anger is an emotion. And sometimes, you know, it's something that happens, but it's, it happens to all of us. We will all get angry. But the question is, what do you do when you get angry? We'll talk more about that too. Ephesians 4 says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's several words here that I, I just like to look briefly at. Uh, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. You are a child of God. Live up to that. You have received 
um, you have received a gift. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Did you earn the right to be a child of God by your perfect life? No, you were given a gift. You received something. So you can't be proud and boastful and say, look what I received. Well, you didn't earn it, you couldn't get it, but somebody gave it to you, so just be thankful, but don't be proud about it. Live a life worthy of the, worthy of the calling that you have received. Uh, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. When you think of the word to bear something, what do you usually think of? Bear a burden. So it's something that's hard to do. It's, you know, it's a burden that you have to carry bearing with one another in love. Because of the love, we bear with one another. Sometimes it's not easy. They're not very lovable. And so you have to kind of grit your teeth, you know, and bear it. But that's how love works. Love is, we are bound together in love, but sometimes it's not as easy as it is, but we need to bear through it. Make every effort. Every effort. You know, I, I tried once, and that was enough. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. What did Jesus pray for the church? That we would be one. That we would be in harmony. So that people would say, boy, they've got what I want. And I want to be a part of that because I, I have all these needs in my life and the church, family, can help me meet those needs. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a, a great privilege that we have, that we can bear one another's burdens and that we can fulfill the law of Christ as we make every effort to do that. Um, there is one body, one spirit, one, uh, one body, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, and, and over all and in the old king, in you all, in y'all. He was from the south. Jesus, Jesus from the south. So uh, we understand uh, those things. And uh, there's hope that we have because of Jesus. So uh, Some of us went to uh, Transparent Men yesterday, and uh, just real quick, they're trying to help young black people in Cleveland or anybody else, and so one church has said, we will sponsor seven young people that want to get into the trades to, to pay for their training. Uh, we will, I'll, I'll give you more information, I, I didn't get it all yet, but if the person is from a family that's a part of a church, is willing to be mentored. There are several conditions that it takes uh, for this person. They will help them get into the trades and they will be mentored and so that they can have a better life. You know, not just because they need to get a job, but because our life is involved in many areas. You know, you might have a good job, but you might not have family, you might not have support. Uh, there might be violence in the home. So many things that make, that are necessary to all come together in order uh, to, uh, in order to, to have the, the life that we want. Uh, in Ephesians 4 it says, in your anger do not sin. Don't give the devil a foothold, you know? If you get angry and you start doing things and saying things that you shouldn't do, uh, and it, it creates disharmony within the church, uh, within your families, whatever, you're giving the devil a foothold. He's got a way in and he will work through that way. So we should be, as James says, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I think we probably all familiar with that scripture. That's, you know, somebody said a long time ago, the, the, the scriptures that worry me in the Bible aren't the ones I can't figure out and understand. It's the ones that I know. <laughs> and that's one, quick to hear. Oh, listen, yeah, 
slow to speak, slow to become angry. Not always easy to do because man's anger does not bring about God's righteousness. You have to be careful, you know, what you say. James talks a lot about, we won't look at those scriptures, about the tongue, you know, it's deadly evil, you know, it's, a little, it's like a spark that sets a forest on fire, you know, the, the evil of the tongue, because you can't unsay it. If you say something, it's said. Uh, that's, that's why answering machines, you like answering machines? You're on an answering machine and now with text, it's even worse, you know, it's there, not only the answering machine, it's, it's there forever and you can't deny you said it, but when you send a text, you know, the whole world on the web, you know, can know, you know, what you say and what you do. So we, we can say that we're sorry, but does that change something really if you've, I think, I hope it does, but the hurt is still there. You can forgive, and they, you know, the old idea, I can forgive, but I can't forget. And sometimes people use that as an excuse for not really forgiving. You know, they don't really forgive. They say, I forgive you, but then they hold that grudge. But how does God forgive? The Bible says that when he forgives, our sins are as far away as the east is from the west. Is that the way it is when we forgive? If somebody has offended us as far as the east is from the, the west? God does that. Our actions are based on our choices. As I said earlier, we can't keep from becoming angry. If something happens, that's an emotion. God gave us emotion so that we can react and have special strength. You've heard of people that there was an accident and somebody with superhuman strength lifted the car, you know, so somebody could get out from underneath it. I think God gives us emotions and extra strength in, in different ways, so those emotions are there. But how do we react? I passed a beautiful garden the other day. I used to have a garden. And uh, I would work, you know, work the soil and spend hours getting it ready and planting it. And for a while I would cultivate it. I'd love to go down and watch it. But you know, by the fall, you know where I knew, how, how I knew where the pumpkins were? Well, they turned orange and all the rest of it was dead weeds, you know. <laughs> that's, that's the way it was, so I don't raise a garden anymore. Uh, all I did was feed the groundhogs and all the other animals. I passed a beautiful garden, all fenced in and everything. And you know what the first thought came to my mind? I didn't know if I should admit that or not. I thought, well, you know, I could come back at night and go in there and pick some tomatoes. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> because I know what's right. I mean, maybe the thought was there and fleeting. Have you ever been tempted to something that's worse than stealing tomatoes? <laughs> we can't control all of our emotions, but we can control the choices that we make based on those emotions. That's, I mean, that's on the web, we will be on the web this afternoon. Uh, I don't know if, you know, if I should say that or not, but kind of that's the way it is with me. You know, I get thoughts, and maybe they're not good thoughts. But how do I react? What do I do with those thoughts? Because all our choices affect our relationship with the people that are around us. And they affect our relationship with God. Remember the story of Saul in the Old Testament? He was told to go kill all the Amalekites. And uh, he goes out and he wins the battle. And he comes back. And Samuel meets Saul as he's coming back. And, and Samuel says, hey, Saul, how did it go? Oh, it went great. We did just what you said. God had told them to destroy them, animals and everything. That that's, was the Old Testament. And... Uh, he, so Samuel 
says to, what, I, I love this scripture, what meaneth the bleeding of these sheep in my ear? <laughs> if you did everything God says, why do I hear sheep? And Samuel said, oh, we brought that back so that we could sacrifice to God. And that other good stuff that we brought, well, we thought maybe it eventually we'd give it to God too. But they, were, they disobeyed God. <clears throat> and so um, in 1 Samuel it says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So God doesn't want us to just do anything we want, and then, oh, I'll bring a sacrifice and... Uh, you know, you can't even bring your sacrifice if you've got something against your brother. You've got to go, you know, and take care of that. <clears throat> and notice he equates, for rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. We know it would be wrong to set up idols in our home. We worship sometimes sports or money or a variety of things. And that can be idolatry. <clears throat> but arrogance is the same as idolatry. Rebellion is the sin of divination or witchcraft or sorcery. And so God doesn't want us to do whatever and then just make a little offering and say, well, now it's okay. God wants us to obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. So then we go back to Matthew. We've talked about we're not supposed to murder. We're not supposed to be angry. Uh, to, to say raka, that's to curse somebody. Or um, the other one is to call a person, oh, you stupid fool. You know, that, you know we, we get in trouble for all of that. And then he goes on to say, and, and I always kind of, you know, segment scriptures, you know. Uh, don't murder don't be angry, and then move on to the next one. But, you know, the, the first word in the next verse is, is what? Therefore. <laughs> Therefore. If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, first go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So we, we understand that there's a connection between the two. So... We don't offer our gifts at the altar, but do you go to God in prayer? Do you meet the Lord in communion? Do you meet the Lord as you study his word? Do you come into his presence? We do. And so we need to, to understand how our relationship with people around us affect our relationship with God. Pretty serious. He doesn't say, if you're offering your gift and remember that there's a problem you have with somebody, as soon as you're done, go and take care of that. Because what happens if you do that? You do it and then you forget to go and take care of it. You know, anything you say, I'm going to do it later, that's the same thing as saying, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. Leave your gift there. And it doesn't matter who the offender or the offendee is. It doesn't matter whether you offended the other person or whether the other person offended you. Because in, uh, in Mark, it says, When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven will forgive you. So it doesn't matter whether you've been the offender or you've been the offendee. It goes back what you've got your part to play in either situation. You can't say I forgive, but I can't forget. We can't use that as an excuse. I forgive you, but I can't forget it, so it's still in the back of my mind. What we can say is what God says to us. I forgive you, 
and I move on from that point. I put it behind me, and it's not going to affect my relationship with you anymore. You know, we're thankful, and we know we need that when it comes to our relationship with God, that he forgives, and that he, it's over. It's done. It's, it's in the past. As far as the east is from the west, forgiveness is kind of like love. It's not a feeling or an emotion, but it's a choice, and it's an action. You know, like loving your enemies. Well, loving your enemies doesn't say, oh, I just feel so good when I'm in their presence. It means I will do the right thing. I will be patient, kind, won't envy, boast, all the things that the Bible defines as love. Is there someone that you have a problem with? They've offended you. Or maybe you've offended them and you're afraid to go talk to them about it. You know there's an issue that is not resolved. What are you going to do about it? The Bible says before you offer your gift at the altar, you've got to go get that right. You can't excuse it. You can't justify it. Because, what does Jesus say? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. If there's a little problem, what, hap what happens with yeast? It gets mixed in and it affects the whole batch. It can affect the harmony of the church if people can't get along. What did Jesus pray? That we would all be one. Why? So the world would believe. If we can't be one, if we can't present an image to the world of who God wants us to be, how could we expect anyone to want to be like us if we aren't better than the world? I think that's the biggest problem in the world today. People can't get along. And I think maybe it's the biggest problem in the church. I can look back over situations in past churches and churches that I know of today that are going through trouble, and it's because people can't get along. They get angry. They, somebody gets proud. Somebody does this. Somebody does that. And it tears the church apart. Are we willing to do something about it? As I said, is there somebody that you have an issue with that you can't get along with? There is no excuse but to go and try to make it right. Maybe it can't, but as much as it depends on you, you have to do everything you can. You have to be willing to forgive and say, hey, it's over, it's done. Maybe it's still in your mind. You can still remember it. But it doesn't affect how you act. Proverbs says, two Proverbs, I'll quick say, the tongue has the power of life and death. You didn't shoot them, but you assassinated their character, or something like that. The power of life and death are in the tongues. Fools give full vent to their rage. A fool gets mad and he gives full vent to his rage. But a wise man brings calm in the end. He doesn't allow that anger to lead him where he doesn't need to go. Life and death. Colossians, talks about, may your words be full of grace and seasoned with salt. Full of grace and seasoned with salt. So Jesus brought new understanding Man, in the past, all you had to do was don't kill anybody. But now Jesus says, oh, this is a lot more serious. And it's more serious because of the consequences 
of sin. Every sin has a consequence for us, for the world, for everybody around us. And so we, we know that Jesus fulfilled the law so that we could understand not only the letter of the law, but the intent of the law. We can follow the letter, find a way, a loophole, but we're not looking for loopholes. We're looking for God to come in and change our heart so that we can have his forgiveness, know his grace, receive it, and just it, be joyful in it, and then share that with others. Our grace, our words full of grace, seasoned with salt. We're going to sing an invitation hymn at this time. Someone is going to come forward this morning. Arrangements have been made. Uh, we're going to have a baptism in two weeks. Uh, we'll explain a little bit why we're doing that. But if anyone else has not accepted Christ as their Savior, we offer you this opportunity to come as we will stand and sing. <clears throat> We're singing I Surrender All, number 596. We will sing the first, second, and fourth verses of 596 as we stand and sing. And the words of this song, all to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. As we sing, may these words, uh, may you be praying these words uh, to the Lord. And if you need to make a confession of faith and want to be baptized, as well, let's stand and sing the first, second, and fourth verses.
Uh, she is a believer. She is a student of the Word of God. She's not able to communicate very well. Uh, she's not able to get around. Uh, so she has a lot of time to listen to the Bible, to listen to Christian uh, radio. Uh, and, and she's a, a, a student of the Word. And so she comes today. Uh, her mobility is limited. Uh, so we're, we have made arrangements to go out to Blue Rock Camp two weeks from today. Right after the service, we'll go out to the camp and uh, have a baptism there. We just got several different options. We thought uh, more people might have the opportunity to go and be a part of this if we do it right after church. And we'll work out some arrangements for eating. We're not sure uh, whether we have a picnic or go to the restaurant or whatever. But uh, that's what we want to do. We want to make it uh, an opportunity for as many of you as possible to be a part of that. Uh, so uh, she, we talked and uh, she understands what it is. Uh, and I will ask her to uh, affirm the good uh, confession. Jesus uh, asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Peter made what we refer to as a good confession. So Sharon, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Uh, that he came to this earth and died for your sins? And do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Okay, God bless you for that uh, confirmation of your faith. And uh, so we, we, look, we look forward to this celebration that we, we will be having coming up. So we've got two weeks. If anybody else uh, wants to be baptized, we would invite you to go and be a part of that. So let's stand and we'll have our closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love that Jesus came into the world to show us how to really have life. Forgive us when we make mistakes and when we allow our sinful nature to, to have its way. We thank you for Sharon and for her love for you and her faithfulness and her desire to, to be obedient to you in this way by testifying to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection by being willing to die to herself, to be buried under the waters, and to be raised to walk in a new life. We thank you for your goodness. Bless us as we go from this place now. We thank you for all that you do for us and help us to, to draw close to you. In Jesus' name, amen.